What's up, guys? If you're not subscribed, please subscribe. Also, please smash that like button on the video and enjoy the show. Do you think that there could be, let's say that that Christian teaching about the beginning and the creator is right? Let's play that. Do you think there could be things in between that? Like many, many layers? Like many layers that, you know, maybe I could even bring in a term right now. We could discuss it and see what you think. But like, do you think there could be like that simulation theory between us and a God? Do you think there could be other universes that exist on the same trajectory that we do? Where, you know, where a universe inside of their universe and so on and so on all the way up to the chain to where God does exist. Yeah, that's a possibility. Uh, it's speculative because sure. our science can only make measurements within the universe in which right. we exist. Right. So we can't make observations or measurements of the angelic realm, for example. We're constrained to our universe. It was Albert Einstein said that once you've got observers in the universe you're not going to be able to detect anything beyond that universe. And so we're constrained. Mm -hmm. Now, we're free to speculate. I mean, this is a lot of what happened in a debate I had with Victor Stenger uh, at the International Skeptic Society. Well, what about what's existing beyond the universe? I find it interesting that the space-time theorems actually gives us some insights on what's possible and not possible uh, beyond uh, the universe. So we can go down that path. And for Christians... They've been debating since the birth of the church, did God create intelligent life on other planets or did he do it only here on planet Earth? The Bible doesn't put constraints on that. There are some theologians that say, hey, when you read the creation Psalms, it looks like God really enjoys creating. Why would he stop at one planet? He must have created life on multiple planets. Yeah. Other theologians say when you read the Gospels, Notice how frequently Jesus refused to perform miracles for the crowds. It seems like he only performs those miracles that are necessary to achieve his purpose. Isn't one human species on one planet sufficient to fulfill God's purposes? This debate's been running for 2,000 years. I find it interesting, though, if you come from an atheistic perspective, you're compelled to believe that life is ubiquitous throughout the universe. Do you mind just for people listening, like we, we all know the term atheism and everything, but how do you how, how do you view that definition? Like when you say atheist, do you do you literally just mean someone who doesn't believe there's any creator and the lights turn off when you die? Or is it more complex than that? Well, you know, the agnostic will say, I don't know if there is a God. The atheist says, I know for sure there is no God. Got it. So no creator, no God. Everything is naturalistic, and uh, yes, uh, when we die, that's just the end of everything uh, for us personally. Right. So, do you think we are alone in the universe then? I was trying to catch your drift on that last answer to see if you were kind of getting there. Well, I'm saying there, from but... a Bible's perspective, we could be alone, and we may not be alone. I mean, there's nothing in the Bible that would forbid God from saying, creating dolphins on another planet. The what only, about humans? Well, the only conceivable constraint is what you see in Hebrews 9 and 10, where it says, Jesus, the creator of the universe, died one time, one place, to save all uh, from sin. Now, we're the only sinners on planet Earth, so that puts no constraint on you know, chimpanzees or dolphins on another planet, because they wouldn't be in the category of being sinners. What did you say there? One, I'm sorry, the definition you had from the Bible. One, Jesus died in one place. One place, one time for all. But their theologians have argued, you know, there could be an intelligent species like us on another planet, a species that's not morally perfect like us. We need to be delivered from our sin and evil. But if they got high technology television, they could have been witnesses to Jesus being crucified and raised from the dead. So I said, even that is not constrained. Uh, however, from an astrophysical perspective, I would agree with Neil deGrasse Tyson. When we look out at the universe, it's out to kill us. Once we get beyond planet Earth, everything is very hostile to advanced life. We haven't looked everywhere, but everywhere we've looked, we only see highly hostile conditions, which suggests from a scientific perspective, it appears that we are alone. Now, astronomers do argue maybe there could be planets with microbes on them, but beings like us, 
that's the rare earth doctrine. It really does look like our galaxy, our planet, uh, our star, it's unique. All right, there's a lot to unpack there. And I, I'm glad you bring up Neil deGrasse Tyson, too. Obviously, that's some of those opinions he's had are very famous now. They've been oh, yeah, I mean, that, that was an outtake he did for an interview, but everybody picked up on it. Yeah. He, but, I mean, he was serious about it. When you do look at yes. the universe, it's out to kill us. Yes, and he, one of the things he said before... He had said this when he was on with Joe Rogan, I guess, what, maybe like a few years ago? Something like that? Yeah. He had talked about how he thinks aliens would be wholly uninterested in us. And actually, Michu Kaku, who I had in recently for a podcast. Do you believe in God? Well, I believe in the God of Einstein. He believed in God, but not the God that intervenes in human affairs. It was the God of order the god of simplicity and elegance. Einstein was asked the question, did the universe have a choice? Is it unique? So universes, you can create universes in an afternoon, but most of them are unstable. Most of them fall apart. Most of them don't work. Our universe is stable. It works. Everything fits together. And then the question is, what set off the bang? That's what we do for a living. We have the Big Bang Theory up to the point where the universe is going to explode. Why did it explode? We think it was a quantum event. And we are here because we are in the universe which decided to explode. So Einstein said, was it all an accident? And he thought, no, it could not have been an accident. He said something similar. Mm -hmm. He talks about it with like the squirrel theory. Like, oh, would you talk to a squirrel? The squirrel does not talk back. You're not interested. And I'm like, I don't know if it's that simple, though. Like, I, I do, you know, I'm not married to whatever, if we've been visited or if they walk among us or how many there are or where they are. I'm not married to any of that. I mean, you can ask Alessi. Before two years ago, he's the one that got me into looking at this stuff. I never I never really cared. So he deserves all the credit? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. I tell you, I've said that on a bunch of podcasts. He deserves credit for me looking at UFOs and stuff like that. But like... I'm not married to the fact that, oh, it is definite and all this stuff. If someone says, like, it's never happened, they've never been here, and they show me great evidence, I'm going to be like, well, sorry, James Fox. Like, that's just what it is. But I, I look at this and, and I go, you know, when I look at the, the, the giant universe we have, it does seem from, a, from our humanity perspective to be very, very potentially narcissistic to assume that there's not hardcore intelligent life out there when we, as you've pointed out, we only even know like what's within our galaxy here. We don't even know, or our universe here, we don't even know how big and dense the other galaxies can get to say nothing of what their quote unquote laws of physics are or aren't according to ours. Well, we do know the laws of physics are pervasive because we've observed them all over the universe. We also know if the laws of physics have ever changed, there'd be no life anytime, anywhere in the universe. So the very fact that we're here is evidence that the laws of physics in the distant universe are the same as they are here. Our astronomical measurements prove that because when we look at a distant galaxy, we can actually measure the laws of physics. When the light left that galaxy, it's identical to what we measure here. Uh, in the lab. Now, you are right that there could be places we haven't looked, but we've looked in a lot of places. I mean, the Star Wars uh, series, it all begins with a galaxy far, far away. Yes. Well, we've looked at galaxies far, far away. None of them match the Milky Way galaxy in their capacity to sustain advanced life. We seem to be living in the only galaxy that's a possible candidate. We're orbiting the only star that we can look at I mean, my peers have looked at tens of millions of stars, measured their characteristics. Our star, the sun, has exceptionally stable luminosity. I mean, a book I put out last year called Design to the Core actually show the luminosity stability of the sun compared to the second best star. The second best star is five times more unstable than our star, the sun doesn't eliminate the possibility of animals, but certainly would eliminate the possibility of global high technology human civilization. So we're orbiting, and I tell my friends who are involved in the search for extraterrestrial intelligent life, you're busy looking at these exoplanets. They're hard to measure. Stars are easy to measure. They're bright. We can measure them with significant precision. Don't even bother pointing our radio telescopes at, quote, a planet, unless it's orbiting the just right star. So until you've got a star that's a candidate, 
we need to use that telescope time for more valuable purposes. Thank you for watching the video, guys. Please hit that subscribe button and check out this clip's full podcast episode by clicking here or in the description below.